This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by six amazing individuals. Greg Ross, Bill Luminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, and Michael Frisky. Thank you all for helping to make this show possible. And if you'd like to help out, become a patron at wheredotheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month for lots of extra content. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? And uh, tonight's show is something kind of unique and different. Uh, It's a driving edition of Where Did the Road Go? So when we did the Seth House stuff, which you can find on the website, it's on the YouTube and everything, there is an audio version. It it did not, uh, the tour did not go up as an audio version because it's a visual tour of the the area, the the Seth House where Jane Roberts channeled Seth. Um, But Saxon flew out here from whatever secret cave he lives in, in the mountains of the Tibet mountains. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, he flew out here and then uh, rented a car and we uh, drove down there to meet Chris. And then we, uh, you know, did the whole Seth house thing for that day. And um, while we drove down there, I brought my recorder and we uh, recorded this show, just Saxon and I, in the car on the way down and then on the way back. So this this first part is obviously on the way down, and it's just the two of us, and uh, I hope it's uh, enjoyable to everyone. We I think we had a pretty interesting conversation, so here you go. So I'm here with Saxon. Hello, hello. He has transformed himself into a car. <laughs> oh, wait, that's a totally different thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, it, it's kind of mecca, so it's, it's uh, you know, adjacent at least. <laughs> and we are on our way to the Seth house, where we will record other stuff. Right now we're driving, so I figured we can we can talk about things. And you were you were bringing up something kind of interesting that I had wondered if you wanted to talk about on the air. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I live near some different indigenous communities and things like that. You know, kind of where the South meets the Midwest, and uh, I have an acquaintance that uh, I did not realize just how much knowledge and experience she had had with sweat lodges and different uh, psychedelics, which they would consider sacraments uh, within uh, her communities. And so she started sharing a lot of different experiences with me and approaches. And because the way that different First Nations and indigenous peoples are uh, interconnected, you know, she'll go to stuff that's relative to her, but she'll also go and participate or support in some of the other, uh, you know, different uh, people's, uh, I guess we would say, uh, gatherings and, and what have you. And she just has so much insight about it. Um, yeah, and it, it was one of those things that I was very curious about that, but I've never talked to somebody that's you know, has a view of this from within those cultures. Right. And yeah, and you know, and I know her in a very like secular setting and things like that too. Um, but she started relating stories about being in sweat lodges in the, the middle of nowhere, you know, miles and miles and miles from civilization. And then suddenly hearing laughter and children playing all around the sweat lodge while they were in the middle of it. Nice. Yeah, you know, and just from her telling of this story, it sounded like, you know, sometimes we have uh, anomalous experiences and they're very creepy and unsettling. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this was something that was like warm. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like it's the the children to come and the children that have been, uh, you know, ancestors and things like that of the group of people she was with. And, uh, you know, that stuff is just like, okay, this is really cool. Uh, 
you know, and it's not dressed up in a movie or somebody trying to... Right. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that, that's an a incredible experience. Um, and she related some personal stories that she's had. And, uh, you know, I, I will leave those to her because they, they seem pretty private. Sure. But uh, even just sort of inside on... You know, if you were going to try and have some type of, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way, like answers or visions or whatever, like, okay, well, you might do uh, mushrooms for this, or, you know, there's a, when I went to the peyote gathering in X place, you know, it was more like that. Um, and it, she'll even sometimes talk about, indigenous peoples in South America and some of their practices. So I, I had no idea I even knew this person basically. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And she's like, you know, some of the people when they do ayahuasca, it's like this, this, and this. And the, the parallel experience to that might be, you know, the Lakota doing X, Y, and Z. And you have to go in with uh, an intention for what you want out of it. And then, you know, you have the experience in your mind's eye and then you want to come back and kind of decipher that and see how it applies. And, you know, sometimes you'll get really good answers and sometimes you'll get stuff that's like, you know, doesn't make any sense and it may never make any sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we uh, we ended up talking for, you know, a good solid hour about all of this. That's cool. Oh yeah, it, it was great. It was great. And even just, you know, and, and I try to be careful, you know, I've got my anthropology background and I don't want to take anybody that's from an indigenous community and make them the, the the shaman medicine person right you know right, stereotype right. in my mind and like hey you know what does it mean when there's a crow outside of my you know <laughs> yeah but you know once we we kind of crack that seal you know the the amount of uh knowledge and experience and depth that she had really came through and i'm like oh okay <laughs> this nice. is this is pretty incredible yeah yeah, you should definitely see if she wants to go on the show sometime. Yeah, I think I'll talk to her about it. You know, we we spent a lot of time talking about perceived reality reality versus actual reality. Yeah. Um, I mean, not that we ever talk about that here. I know, I know. There's never anything that uh, crosses <laughs> our minds. But uh, I think she would. You know, we just have to figure out uh, scheduling and, you know, what she's comfortable talking about. Talking yeah, about. yeah, sure. Yeah. But... Um, you know the the depth and breadth of her experiences and the groups of people she's around that are pretty central to some of these communities uh, was just I, I just didn't have any idea basically that uh, she was this close to a lot of these different uh, oh gosh medicine people I guess would be the right way to put it huh that's really interesting yeah I'm going to uh, so I told her we're going to do what we're doing today, uh -huh. uh, which, you know, the people, our listeners will find out about. Uh, well, I, I already said we're going to the Seth house. Oh, that's right. You did say we're going yeah. to the Seth house. Sorry, I've been hitting the head a lot, guys. <laughs> um, Me too. Yeah, yeah. But she was like, yeah, like, I need a full report on that when you get back. So <laughs> um, I, I will talk to her about that, and, and uh, maybe we can get her on sometime to cool. talk about her experiences. Yeah, the, the Seth house reached out to us. Uh, after we did the episodes on Seth and invited us down. And you flew all the way up here from Arkansaka, Alabama, uh, Kentucky? Yes. Yeah, somewhere there. Yes, One of those. Yes. They're all the same place. <laughs> I mean, they kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're meeting Chris there. Yeah. Um, you didn't do the Seth show with us. Jack Huntington did. But Jack's in, like, uh, North Carolina or something like that. So he was not available to come out on, and then just come up here. Yeah, um, and I'm excited to get to go, and, you know, fortunately I get to pop into New York and come by and see you periodically, so this made a lot of sense. Like, oh, this would be great, because uh, y'all won't believe this. Uh, Soraya knows this, obviously. Chris and I have never been in the same place physically. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people that have asked us to do other podcasts and shows and whatever... Uh, often we'll put Chris and I together because of our where, relationship from where did the road go. Right. Not knowing that Chris and I have never actually met in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I didn't realize that. I thought you meant it like strange realities or something at some point. You know, we were always uh, like missed each other. I, I was supposed to go to strange realities two years ago and my flight got canceled and then That's right. Yeah, it just it's it's always been one of those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited. This is gonna be fun. I hope so. Oh, I think it's gonna be great. You know, there's also the uh and, and I don't know how, I'm pretty sure they have tours and stuff where the Fox sisters started the whole spiritualist movement oh. just a little bit north of me. And I've considered going up seeing if we can do something up there at some point. Oh, I think that'd be great. So, and I mean, a lot of people dismiss that as a hoax, but it seems like it follows the same poltergeist type pattern of there was probably a legitimate phenomena and then people expected there to be a phenomena and it stopped. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's... Once you start doing, you know, different gatherings and you become sort of, um, what would we call them when, they, you know, all this became fashionable in that period oh, of the yeah, spiritualist yeah. movement. Like, people were going expecting things to happen and you kind of had to deliver yeah, or, yeah. you know, you, you were going to get uh, made fun of and other things and, and, and ostracized. And, and that's the whole trickster element, you know, I mean, it's there. And then you start faking it because you have to. Right. Um, you know, and I always said it like, like someone like Yuri Geller. Yeah. I mean, the guy's weird. He has, you know, spook uh, connections. Uh, but he's also been tested in some very uh, big labs as far as doing psi and stuff and has done very, very well in those tests. So it suggests that he really does have some uh, pretty strong psi ability. But if you're going to be on a national stage, you don't want that to fail. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, this is an octopus of turns. It really is. These are the, the intersections in the uh, uh, different towns in New York fascinate me. <laughs> you know, when you get to the downtowns. Uh, probably like uh, the, the spooks around here in Gettler. <laughs> <laughs> like the what? The spooks around Yuri Geller. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, and, and, you know, just as an aside, if you look at how many uh, or how much interest and effort some of these groups have put into uh, looking into psi phenomenon and the money they spent on it, I mean, bingo swan and remote viewing and these other yeah. things, like, there's obviously an understanding that this is real. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think the scientific evidence is there without any... Even even skeptics admit that the evidence is there. They just won't accept it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and But going back to your trickster element, you know, you get on TV and uh, you have to perform. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that, you know, opens up a whole world of other problems. Because yeah, all you have to do is fail once and you'll be, you know, ruined. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, well, he's not really... You know what he claims to be, or whatever, and it's like the stuff is not uh, like clockwork. It, you know, it is always elusive. I've occasionally had psychics tell me they're never wrong, and I'm thinking, okay, nobody's never wrong. Yeah. Like even in mundane stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The information they're getting may not be wrong, but their interpretation is certainly going to be wrong now and again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, so it was interesting. I. When I was talking to my uh, friend that had all the different the, the indigenous women, yeah. uh, we were talking about because she'd never heard of Seth before. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, I was like, you know, it's being channeled through Jane Roberts, and her husband would sit there. And uh, you know, one of the things that's very appealing about Seth was how straightforward Seth is, and also just being very open about you know this uh, uh, intelligence is coming through Jane. And immediately she goes, oh, so it's getting filtered through Jade's personality yeah. and, and who she is. And I was like, yes, exactly. And she already knew all of that. <laughs> huh. And I'm like, oh, there's a whole other uh, area of insight that uh, I had not considered that, you know, other people out of our circles would just be aware of. Uh, but that seemed like something very natural to her that if you were channeling an entity or working with spirit or, or whatever it might be from her perspective, uh, it gets filtered through the person that is doing yeah. the work. And I was, I don't know, I, I thought that was really uh, telling. And it was one of the reasons I think Seth said that he could never be channeled by anyone else 
because it wouldn't be the same. Right, right. And, and Sarah, why did Seth choose the name Seth? I, was there a reason for that? I thought there was some kind of like... I don't... I don't think there was any deep reason for it. I think he just liked the name. Just liked the name? Okay. I remember it being something kind of like, and then I may be making it up completely, but it was a very matter of fact, like, well, you know, this is a, a, a name that I liked and I used. And I can't remember, I for can't this remember if it was the name of one of his past lives or something. I can't, it's been too long since I've read it and I don't remember. They might know at the Seth House. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I would assume they would probably know at the Seth House. But it was another one of those things where it's not like, oh, my name is Marilyn because I was Marilyn Monroe in a past life or something like that. Yeah, there's no claims to be anyone super famous. Right, right, or, you know, influential or impacted history or anything. It's just like, oh, yes, that's a good name. (laughs) Um, What was interesting, I was listening to... Uh, and Jack, and Jack wrote me about this, too, because apparently he had also just listened to it. Jeremy Vaney put up a Paratopia 121, which is called the Evolver. And uh, it's a lot of Jeff musing about different ideas that he's had. Mm-hmm. And the thing about Jeff and Jeremy is that they absolutely would not pay attention to any channeling. <laughs> and I understood that. Like, because there was a point before Seth where I wouldn't either. Right. Until I sat down and read Seth Speaks and went... Holy crap, this is actually very detailed, very on point. And she, Seth is talking about stuff that we didn't actually know back then, but we now know. And I was like, okay, that's that's really interesting. And then I tried finding any debunking or whatever and couldn't find anyone who could debunk it. Wow. Because uh, I figured, well, there's got to be some massive contradictions here, but there really aren't in the whole uh, stream of books they put out. Um, and sometimes the sessions go months in between. And he picks up right where he left off and does this in front of people as well. I mean, not that, I mean, that would be impossible. They could always in private go back and see what he said. Um, But there was never, you know, like I never heard anyone say that she seemed uh, deceptive or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, so Jeff is talking about, you know, his ideas and stuff. And so many of them are aligned with stuff that Seth said. Oh, interesting. And I'm just kind of laughing and I'm going... So you, you came to Seth without actually ever reading Seth. <laughs> and then Jack wrote me, he's like, hey, I was just listening to the Evolver on Paratopia. And man, Jeff's so, throwing out some real Sethian ideas there. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, and I could never get him to read it. Like he looked up a few quotes online and he's like, yeah, it just sounds like the same channeling gibberish. And I'm like, you're looking up quotes. It's not the same thing. Yeah, we, you don't have the whole context of those things, yeah. you know, and how those conversations came about and process, you know, because there's so much, like, interaction. Um, you know, and, and not to say that, like, you know, uh, the questions that were being brought to Jane were all over the place or, like, a, just an active, active dialogue, but, you know, there's definitely a, well, it was. a back and forth going on. Yeah, yeah. Because she had the classes and people would just ask questions. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Um, and also, uh, Jeff's wife passed away in December. Oh, no. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that until Jeremy, uh, if you go to Our Undoing Radio, he does a nice uh, piece on it. Oh man. And, and, and the effect it had on him. Yeah. Um, so that that's, that's worth a listen. Um, he almost stopped putting up the Paratopias. Because he said he was kind of doing it to keep Jeff's memory alive for her. Right. And then with her gone, he was like, do I want to still do this? And luckily he decided, yeah, he's going to finish putting them up because they're kind of a valuable resource. Oh, they are. And, you know, it was hard to find when the the interim period uh, when Jeff was still with us. But, you know, they, they just weren't getting posted anywhere if he went and looked up the old... Uh, lists and you know iTunes or whatever. They started charging like fifty cents an episode at one point. Mm. Well, see, I wouldn't mind paying for it, but I just yeah, like I had a hard time finding them before. I didn't know Jeremy it, started reposting them. I didn't know it existed. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I talked to Jeff, and that's how I found out that, that he had a podcast. And I'm, you know, I'm always amazed listening to this, going, yeah, they they were on the same path that where did the road go went down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. 
you know, and, and maybe we got a little bit further at this point. I mean, it's hard to tell because we don't know what the end, end result is, but like some of the same ideas come up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm just like, man, Paratopia and Where Did the Road Go? Or, no wonder Jeff liked Where Did the Road Go? Because it's kind of the same, it's a continuation of what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's just, it's, it's hard to listen to those episodes sometimes because... You know, I want to talk to him. Yeah. I mean, I can talk to Jeremy, but it's not the same. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, you, you had the relationship with Jeff and yeah, just listening. Oh, go ahead. Go also, ahead. never met him. Yeah, you never met him in person. Y'all were going to try to get together for a concert, I think, and it didn't quite happen. It was, uh, actually, he was going to come out to Alba Twitch, and then we were going to go see One Eyed Doll in Baltimore. Okay. And then I think something happened with his son, and he couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a good friend back home that's just a, you know, he's kind of a, a slightly irritated, chain-smoking guy. Uh, <laughs> if I can, you know, it, I say that w- w- with uh, in all endearing qualities as possible. But Jeff always kind of reminds me of him. Huh. There's just something about, like, the, the sort of uh, attitude that he carries on the radio. And so, like, having that mixed in with the show and then the thoughts uh, and, and concepts about, you know, all these different experiences and anomalous things and, and what have you, uh, I don't know. It just made me like Jeff a lot for somebody that I never had the chance to meet. And yeah. so I sort of feel like I know him, but I know I don't. But, <laughs> you know, because my, uh, my best friend has a certain, like, there's a crossover if there was a Venn diagram of those two, they would probably line up a lot. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that. I know I know what he's going to say next. I know that attitude, you know. Uh, and him and Jeremy had such an interesting sort of uh, dynamic between them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, if anyone, and, and for anyone who hasn't heard the Paratopia episodes, they're on Jeremy's Our Undoing Radio uh, podcast. So he does his show, and then he also puts up the Paratopias every week. And apparently there are some live ones they did that they're going to be putting up too. Apparently he did lot. They occasionally did live ones on a Sunday. Oh, I bet that's pretty cool to listen to. Yeah, he's trying to put them up in order. He said uh, for when things came out, so everything would make sense. Mm-hmm. So if they talked about something on the live show and then talked about it again on the following show, people would be able to listen in order. Right. Um, and he doesn't remember exactly when they start. <laughs> So, I wonder how many episodes they recorded for Paratopia. Well, they're up to 121 right now. Wow. Okay. And so I don't know how many more are left. Uh, they are in the pay episodes. Because uh, Jeremy said that they're, they're just... When he was on last time, I think he said they just started the pay episodes. Or just about to start the paid episodes. And he's like, so there's a lot of people who haven't heard this stuff unless they bought the, the download. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they did that. Not They didn't, weren't really trying to make money off of it. They were just, I think, tired of not getting... Uh, people not paying attention to them. Right. So they right. figured, okay, if people want to pay attention, they can give us 50 cents for the episode. Right, right. Well, I think that's important. Um, you know, I... I've alluded to my martial arts a lot on the show, and uh, I charge people a little bit to teach, but it's more so I know those people are invested. Right. It's not right. like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make money off of it, and I would teach for free, but people don't show up when you do it for free. <laughs> well, it's not worth anything if you do it for free. Well, exactly, exactly. And I actually, at one point, uh, and fortunately I didn't do this to this instructor, but he... he just commented to me one time he's like no too many people work to develop this art for it to be given away Mm. you know it's like you know it's um it's out of respect for their other people's work and the things i put myself through that uh i charge a little bit like oh that makes sense yeah no that totally makes sense um yeah sometimes if you try to give stuff away for free people are like well it's clearly not worth anything right right I always think there's probably stuff on YouTube that we could find if we knew how to search for it that 
would be life changing information for your <laughs> health or something. Right. That's like some little small practice you could do every day. I don't know, but somebody posted it for free and nobody's ever looked at it because it wasn't done with high production values. Yeah. And like, yeah. there's no telling what gyms are out there uh, that we just don't pay attention to because, you know, we, we, unfortunately, we don't value things that people share freely. And, and also, YouTube is such, I mean, it's, it's algorithm driven, but there's also, uh, I don't know if I talked about this on the air or not, when I was listening to Behind the Bastards, uh-huh. uh, they did a show on the uh, project for the New American Century. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with this? A little bit. So it was a neocon group at the end of the 90s mm-hmm. that had like Cheney, um, Rumsfeld, I believe Bush was in it, uh-huh. um, Wolfowitz, mm-hmm. all the neocons, like 10 out of the 16 people in this group ended up on the Bush administration mm-hmm. when he got elected. Uh, and a year before 9-11, one of the things they were talking about is militarizing the Middle East. And one of the famous statements they made is, well, what we need is another Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Which they got a year later when Bush was in office, which is very obviously suspicious. Right. Um, Behind the Bastards does not seem to take any conspiracies as a, as a thing. And I always think that's, that's kind of... Uh, Ignorant, really. I mean, because conspiracies happen all the time. That doesn't mean everything's a conspiracy. Right, right. You know, that's the problem. And, and I almost wonder sometimes if you get these people who are, like, um, intentionally throwing out nonsense conspiracies to just kind of dilute the, 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 the knowledge out there. You know, like... like uh, Spooks, basically. Right. Throwing out this stuff saying, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this, and then this. And, you know, get that stuff spread in so it just seems ridiculous and no one pays attention to it. But they said when they first started, they did two shows on 9-11. Mm-hmm. And he said if you search for them on YouTube, they do not come up. Oh, interesting. And then they tried to search for, you can go into your channel and you can search for something. He said when they search for it on their own channel... It does not come up. Interesting. And they're like, what's that all about? And I'm like, yeah, it almost seems like censorship, doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah. they're not pro-conspiracy. That's the other thing. Because they, they, they're like, we're not really talking about anything that controversial. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's fun. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I, I think there's a lot thrown out there in the muddy of the water so you don't figure out what's actually happened. Yeah. And so when you do find stuff, people can say, uh, you know, you're just crazy or tinfoil hat person. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think that's absolutely intentional. And, you know, I think, uh, oh, the, the Wind of Change uh, uh, podcast where they talked about the Scorpions and uh, the Berlin Wall coming down and... You know, there was a rumor that uh, Wind of Change had been... Uh, oh, right. Like, basically a, a FBI-sponsored uh, uh, endeavor. And by the end of the show, you know, the conclusion is this is certainly in the realm of the things that they do. Uh, they uh, funded different organizations to, like, take Nina Simone around Africa. And this yeah. is when Nina Simone had, like... Um, basically rejected her United States citizenship and things and hated the U.S. government, but they had found a way to uh, set up an uh, uh, African-American nonprofit that paid for her to go and, you know, I mean, like, yeah, this is some very yeah. interesting stuff, but the, the other end of it is the, the final conclusion, or not conclusion, is like, they basically say, even if they didn't do it, they would want you to think that they did. Yes. And there's a lot of that that also goes on and it's sort of like we want you to believe that we would do this but only a little bit but yeah. enough where it's in the back <laughs> of your mind to think like huh I don't know if I want to mess with them they might have done this yeah uh, it's it's so complicated yeah and you can't put anything past the the, the spooks of the government really yeah I mean it's, it's not like the entire CIA decides to do something. All it needs is a little cell within the CIA to decide to do something. Right. I mean, the reason everything's hidden in black projects and, and farmed out is so that it can't, it's not subject to Freedom of Information Act. It's not, you know, it's not accountable. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. 
So there, there's a lot they've learned how to get away with and manipulate the public. There, there is, and I don't know if you saw. Did you look through the uh, the report that the Pentagon put out on their investigation with Aro? And I know you. No, I, 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 I posted it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Alex Hollings that does a lot of uh, aviation, military aviation coverage. And he's an interesting guy because he started out on TikTok, but uh, he's a retired Marine and just love aviation and has a little bit of a different insight to these things. But but he does great coverage. He's won awards for his journalism in this area and things like that. Mm. And so he read through it and he, he said there's some things in it that are really interesting, even though it says there's no extraterrestrial vehicles. And he's like, right. yeah. uh, But he said that there is stuff in there that basically indicates that people working for the Department of Defense that would have had some knowledge of what's going on if they saw some of these things that were being tested they would think that they were otherworldly yeah and he goes and, and so he's like think about that for a second they're saying people that live in these worlds are seeing things that are you know things we're developing and testing yeah that they would not believe was from earth yeah <laughs> you know and i'm like that's that's pretty wild well i mean that's like when the tic tac video mm-hmm. came out and the the guys on the ship who were military were like we don't have anything like that and i'm like you may not know what we have you certainly don't know everything we have. Right, right. You know, like if people were stating that as, well, this proves it's extraterrestrial and it's like, no, they, no. they just don't know what it is. Yeah, and if you got it so compartmentalized, even the people that are deep into it may not realize it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, that was called the Go Fast video, and I think someone proved it wasn't going fast. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was relative like, to uh, distance and, and things like that. Yeah, um, you know, so the thing is, all this time we've been hearing, oh, the government's about to disclose. Just wait, it's going to be a big deal. What do they disclose? Yeah, none of that. We don't have any of that. None, mm-hmm. none of that's anything. And you know, now people are like, well, obviously they're lying. It's like <laughs> maybe. I maybe. mean, but the government always lies. But yeah. also, why are you still pursuing this? Because mm-hmm. if they came out and said they had something. They're probably still lying. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, gosh. I mean, I, I go back to, like, Gary McKinnon and, and all of the legal troubles he went through um, in the United States trying to extradite him. And oh, put this him is the guy who hacked the... Uh, yeah, he hacked... Uh, yep. I can't remember. It was... Department of Defense or something? I can't remember if it was Department of Defense, the Air Force, or the Navy, or uh, NASA. But you know, it was where he came across what he said were non-terrestrial officer lists. Yes. A couple of pictures yes. and things. Basically, you know, they went after that guy. So who knows what he saw, but that was a problem. You know, yeah. uh, uh, he, they considered him to have committed some very serious felonies. Well, that, that he also embarrassed them by getting through their security. That, that's true, too. And you look at what's happened to some other whistleblowers, uh, and then think about the people that are coming forward about UFOs and UAP and nothing, nothing. nothing's happening to yeah. them. And I, I think that's a big tell, especially when these people all have connections to, uh, you know, uh, oh, uh, well, Air Force Intelligence, OSI, all those whatever things. Uh, well, you, you don't leave those organizations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just had Walter Bosley on. I don't know if this is going to air before or after that, but uh, one of the things he says, I think, in the Patreon is that even though he retired and he wants nothing to do with it, they can reactivate him at any time. There you go. He's like, once you're in, you're in. Mm -hmm. He's like, there's no getting back out. Um, And, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of scary to me, honestly. Yeah. Because you basically handed over your life to somebody Mm -hmm. who Mm -hmm. really can't be trusted. Right. Who does not have your best interests at heart. Yeah. I occasionally will step back and, and look at uh, uh, Richard Doty and just think, like, man, what are they putting this guy up to? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, because... And I'll see people that think everything Richard Doty has said is true and that, you know, he 
he had to recant what he said to uh, uh, Paul Benowitz because, you know, he was getting in trouble, whatever. Uh, I feel like at some point some of these guys that were his handlers were just messing with him too. Like, okay, Rick, we want you to go back out and say this and this actually happened. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm like, I don't know. And there are some people who will believe, even when someone's discredited, they'll if they're saying what they want to hear. Yeah. There, yes. there have been studies done that people respond more emotionally than logically to data. Yes. So you will, if you're hearing something that, that makes you feel good, makes you, you know, pleases you, you're more likely to take that as real than even if there's, you can prove logically it doesn't make sense or it's, or you can prove it's untrue, that's less important than how yeah. it makes you feel. And it's very hard for anyone to separate those two things. That's why that's why people with narcissistic personality disorder are so good at manipulating people because they're so good at telling people just what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, they start out with that, that, that telling them, you know, kind of love bombing them and telling them everything they want to hear and making it seem like they are, you know, right in tune with them. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, think about this. Um, Everybody's probably had this experience where you've had some type of, like, illness and some symptoms, and so you go Google it, and some god-awful result comes up that says you're going to die in two days, and we've all panicked when we've read that and thought, like, oh, my gosh, what if I do have... Well, everything's cancer. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. Uh, But, you know, that's that sort of, like... Uh, 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 emotional confirmation uh, or fear confirmation, yeah, yeah. but it doesn't actually mean that you have cancer, and it doesn't necessarily match with what you're experiencing. But you get that in the back of your head, yes. going, "What? What if it is cancer? Do I have something in my lungs? You know, I have been breathing hard lately." <laughs> um, well, you, you you look at it and and you say, "Okay, well, oh, that's pretty minor." All right, that one's pretty minor, and that pretty much describes... Oh, but it also could be cancer. What if it's cancer? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. I mean, I don't have any of these other symptoms, but maybe they just haven't gotten there yet. Right. Or, you know, uh, like, you know, every time I go to the doctor, they take my blood pressure. And my blood pressure is always just a little high. Oh, mine too. And I always tell myself, well, that's because I had coffee right before I got here. Um, is it really the coffee or is that just what I tell myself to feel better about it and therefore I have decided (laughs) that it was the coffee and not that uh, my blood pressure is actually high which it's probably high (laughs) y'all I had I don't know there's nothing paranormal related to well sort of because uh, so I've been diabetic since I was like I think 12 Mm -hmm. and uh, when I was about 30 maybe a little before, I had gone to the eye doctor. And I hadn't gone to the eye doctor in a while. And when you're diabetic, one of the things that can affect is the the capillaries in your eyes. And I did not have the best control. Well, it's not even that I had bad control. I actually just never checked it. I just did it by feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I go to the eye doctor, and I'm a little concerned because it's been a long time since I had been to the eye doctor. And the guy's looking at my eyes, and he just keeps leaning back. He goes, huh. And then he look a little more, and they go, huh. And I'm panicking. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, what is he seeing? And then finally he leans back and goes, how long have you been diabetic? And I'm like, uh, since I was, like, like, however many years, it's 20 years or whatever. And he goes, huh. And he starts looking at my eyes again. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, what is happening right now? Yeah. And then finally he leans back and goes, so your eyes are perfect. And I went, but and he's like but and I'm like what was with all the huh and he goes oh uh, your eyes are perfect and you've been diabetic for 20 years <laughs> he's like I wouldn't know you were diabetic looking at your eyes I've never seen that before right so like some of that I actually uh, attribute to the Kundalini oh interesting that makes perfect sense. Because it really should not have been perfect. And there's still, in, you know, every once in a while I'll have like a spot. And they'll be like, oh, you got like a little spot there, a little hemorrhage there, but it's nothing. And we're not going to worry about it. Come back in a year. Huh. And it's just like, I feel like 
I don't know. I, I feel like the Kundalini does healing stuff that I'm not aware of. Mm-hmm. Or it gives me a little more endurance to this stuff. Because I feel like I should be dead a few times over at this point. Right, right. And, uh... But, yeah, I mean, I was panicking like crazy because he kept saying, you know, huh. <laughs> it's like, okay, great. Yeah, like, you're not making me feel better. And then he died of a brain aneurysm. Oh, gosh. And uh, he was young, too. And then, like, the guy who replaced him, I go into, and he, you know, thoroughly checks my eyes, doesn't say a word. And then when he gets done, he starts lecturing me about being diabetic and taking care of my eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, God, what did you see? And then when he gets done, he's like, that being said, your eyes are perfect. Ha. And I'm just like, what? why would you do that? <laughs> it's like, that's just mean, man. <laughs> it's like, I'm well aware. I thank you. Oh, wow. You know, so speaking of Kundalini, how often do you do, you do it, like, uh, work with that energy more just very casually now because you've been... Uh, it works with me. Works with you. Okay. Yeah, I don't get much of a choice. Okay. Um, and sometimes just talking about esoteric stuff with someone will set it off. Ah, I see. Interesting. Um, and sometimes driving sets it off for some reason. I don't know. And a lot of times I'm listening to esoteric podcasts and stuff. Right. Um, but sometimes it hurts. It's still, it, like, I still get pain at the base of my spine. Uh-huh. Uh, not as bad as I did when I was younger, but, like, to the point where I've had to stop driving before. Mm-hmm. And, like, kind of stretch my back as straight as I can, take deep breaths, and try and get it to, like, you know, resolve a little bit. Um, I was coming back from, I went a few years ago, probably when we turned to 2020, that New Year's. Uh, I was coming back from a friend of mine's because he was just like, you doing anything for New Year's? And I was like, no. He's like, me neither. Want to come over and watch a movie or something? So I'm coming back from there. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. And it kicks in. And I'm like, oh, really? No, come on. And it started hurting so bad that I had to pull over and get out of the car. And I'm trying to straighten my back as best I can. I'm trying to do breathing exercises. I'm like, please don't let a cop come by. Because that's... I mean, I guess I would probably just tell him I was I was tired, so I stepped out of the car. But I clearly probably looked like I wasn't okay. <laughs> and it's New Year's. Yeah. I'm sure I would have gotten a slight interrogation about, you know, why I was standing outside of my car at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, sometimes it just starts pulsing. Um... And that's, that's fine. That doesn't bother me unless it wakes me up. Because mm. that can be kind of annoying. Because then i got to get it to calm down so I can go back to sleep. Um, but it's... Yeah, it kind of... It has a mind of its own. So it activates when it wants to activate. I can do breathing exercises and meditation stuff to kind of, like, kick it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if I'm not feeling good. Uh, that's always been my go-to, is that I just sit, meditate, do breathing exercises, and I can feel it start pulsing along my spine. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then I'll usually feel better. Um, the only time it didn't work is when I had COVID. Mm. Or there's, there, there have been times where I've been really sick with, like, the flu or something, where it wasn't as effective. But COVID's the only time it completely stopped. Like, I couldn't even get it to generate any energy. Interesting. And I have no idea why that, you know, like... I mean, everything's interconnected. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. for instance, Xanax, I take a small dose of Xanax to sleep. That will calm it down. So if I'm about to go to sleep and it's it's pulsing at me, I can take a Xanax and after about 10, 15 minutes, the pulsing will calm down. Okay. So it, th- there's definitely a connection between the, the physical and the energy. Uh-huh. Um, which, of course, is also what's happening when you're doing breathing exercises and stuff. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of just unpredictable, and I, I you know I never trained with any of that stuff. I just learned how to calm it down, really. So I never took like Kundalini yoga classes or anything like that because I'm not sure that's really going to help with what I'm dealing with. Right, right. Interesting. And, and it interacts with certain other people, but only certain people, mm-hmm. which is uh, I think you need to be in that yeah, way. But, uh, yeah, so, and some people it reacts negatively to, so, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's fascinating. You know, in all, every 
tradition of working with energy has different sets of rules too and uh, it, it's hard to navigate that so I'm you know it, being as you know in tune with it as you are I think you're just fine to do it the way that works for you yeah well and I have to basically <laughs> yeah yeah so all right we're almost at the Seth house so I'm gonna stop this for now awesome we'll pick it up later all right, so that was the conversation on the way to the Seth house. And if you haven't watched that stuff, uh, it was a pretty interesting conversation. Uh, the, the the actual interview parts, I think, around two hours long, and the, the tour is about a half an hour. Chris Ernst did all the editing on it, and I think it came out really nice. And uh, we'll get back to the uh, conversation after that um, in a minute. So this is the mid-show break. Um, next week, I think, we're going to have listener stories. And if you have a story you want to submit to the show or you want to come on and talk about stuff that's happened to you, stories at wheredotheroadgo.com is the place to email me. Um, that's the best place where I can actually keep track of everything. And um, wheredotheroadgo.com is where you can find everything. So it's all the social media links, Discord, the, the you can get shirts and stuff there as well. Eventually the uh, documentary. Magicians long to see that um, Chris Ernst did will be up there. It is now available for all patrons for free. So if you're a patron and it's only three bucks to become a Patreon, it's you can watch the documentary for nothing and you get extra content every week plus a, a show a week early usually, sometimes more than a week early. And uh, like that that Robert Guffey stuff, you got uh, both shows together in one three hour block. Um, so yeah, where did the road go dot com. Everything's there. Patreon link. You can donate to the show. Join us on social media. All the emails are there and shows all the way back to the beginning. Also, the documentary will be available, hopefully, very, very soon on Amazon. Um, okay, so uh, I, I, I always should mention this. If you're into heavy music, I do a heavy music show. It's almost 30 years old at this point. Uh, in June, it's going to be 30 years old. It's called The Last Exit for the Lost. And it's uh, underground, dark, and heavy music. So metal, punk, industrial. So there's some comedy music. There's some some avant-garde stuff that's kind of undefinable. It's a very strange show sometimes. And we do movie reviews and stuff like that in between. And it's a weekly show, and you can check out. There's a whole archive at thelastexit.org. All right. As for recommendations, I'm going to go with a show called Constellation. I think this was on Apple TV, which is good because it means it probably won't get canceled after one season like everything that's on Netflix. Um, this was really, really good, and uh, it's kind of a mind bender. I did figure it out pretty quickly, um, but it was really enjoyable and really well done, as most of the sci-fi on Apple TV is. I... I'm not a, a Mac fan. Like I don't like Apple computers, but I don't like iPhones and stuff like that. But man, their streaming service has some of the best sci-fi and they're always quality shows. And Constellation is not a, uh, an exception to that. It is, it is a really, really well done show, a very unique idea. And I'm not sure I was a big fan of the end of the season. The last thing that happens in the season, I was a little like, I don't know where you're going with that. I'm not sure I like that. But overall, I highly recommend checking it out. It's it's a really cool series. It's like eight episodes. So uh, well worth checking out for the, if you're a fan of sci-fi and weird sci-fi, because it definitely is that. All right. So this next segment is Sax and I talking after the Seth house and driving to the Connecticut Hill graveyard, which we don't really have anything from. So there's not going to be anything from that. But uh, here's our trip from the Seth house to Connecticut Hill. So now we are we are leaving the Seth house, Saxon and I. Chris is somewhere behind us because um, he met us there because he drove from Baltimore. Mm hmm. And uh, what were your impressions of the Seth House? Uh, you know, it was a really neat place. I, I love the work that they're doing there. Um, you know, we, as she was taking us around the house, it was neat to kind of feel the energy in different rooms. And it was something that uh, Ashera really called out. And you could, like, oh yeah, there's certainly a different vibe in this room or that room or whatever. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed it. It's something uh, I, I'd like to go back there sometime and spend some more time. 
Yeah, there was de- there were definitely certain spots in particular, especially in the carriage house there, where you could really feel the energy. Um, almost spinning energy, like, to me, anyway. Yeah, it, it, you know... We all experienced it a little bit differently, but in the same spots. Right, yeah. Um, you know, and she didn't really lead us a lot on that either. Just like, I just want you to go in there and see what you think of it. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was different. And then, then, you know, you get a lot of, like, chuckles and things like, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I felt, uh, I'd say it just felt heavier. I don't, yes. I don't quite know how yeah, to explain yeah. that. But. Well, well, the one spot by the closet there in, in the house uh, that they said was really strong, you know, when I walked over there, it almost felt like I had taken a step up, like, a, it, like you know, pressure of gravity type of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, kind of like heavier. It's just not, that's not how I would describe it. Like, things just got, I guess things got heavier. It felt like I stepped up as opposed to stepping on an even surface, which it was. Right, right. Or like moving through like a field of some kind that was giving you resistance. Mm-hmm. Like a heavy, heavy wind, except it wasn't wind. Right. And there was a one spot in the living room in the carriage house where we all felt it uh, in our back, kind of Kundalini-esque or yes. something like that. Yeah. And that was interesting. Definitely. Um, yeah, we'll definitely do more stuff with them. And it's a worthwhile cause to restore that building. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Sir. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, even even for people who sneer at uh, channeling, as I once did, um, it's still historically important. It's historically important, and, you know, it, like, talking about some of the people that came there. Yeah. You know, she had mentioned uh, the author of Jonathan Seagull, uh, Jim Henson... Uh, is it Jack Monroe? That was Monroe Institute? No. Um, um, oh, what I've been hitting the head too many times. <laughs> uh, That's my excuse. Come on. I mean, you've been hitting the head more recently too many times than I have. That, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, but anyway, you know, so you've got all of these people coming through that the Seth materials influenced in one way or the other. And it probably influenced their art a little bit. Oh, yeah. And uh, so the way that, you know, the, 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 the strands of uh, Seth Speaks and the stuff that Jane Roberts wrote reaching out, uh, you know, over the last several decades is uh, powerful and impressive. I, I feel like even if it was completely not legitimate, it, it's kind of like Castaneda. Again, like, regardless of what the source is, the stuff actually works. It's inspirational. It has a, a profound effect on you. So if she was making that up, she was brilliant. Yeah, she was doing a great job. But why would you make that up instead of... I mean, okay, so she was a woman. Maybe maybe she felt like she couldn't just write this stuff and have anyone take her seriously in 1965. Um, but she could have written under a pseudonym mm-hmm. uh, and written as a man. Um, or, you know, instead of channeling the material, which seems like the least legitimate way to get it out there. Right. Unless that's the legitimate way it's coming in. Right, right. So I I fully believe, and and because of her skepticism, too, of her own ability, I I fully believe that whatever was happening was happening. Like, I don't know what Seth was, but I don't believe she was intentionally, you know, fraudulent. Right, exactly. Like, it might have been her, her deeper part of her consciousness. It might have been another entity. It could have been something we can't even think of. But in the end, I, I think she was at least genuine. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and, you know, and to your point, that sort of, like, questioning it the entire time uh, is part of what makes it valid. Because, you know, all of us that have uh, experiences... I was going to say odd or unusual, but I don't actually want to call it that. <laughs> but, you know, we all, like, did that really happen? Was oh, yeah. it just the wind going yeah. by? Uh, you know, am I going crazy? And so the fact that she was having that at the same time, because charlatans don't question themselves. Well, yeah, charlatans are very certain of themselves. Exactly. Um, I remember sitting on the edge of the cliff uh, in the Willard graveyard overlooking Seneca Lake one day. I think I was waiting for my friends to get home or something. Like, I was hanging out with one guy, and then he had a duo do thing, and I was supposed to go hang out with someone else. Whatever it was, I ended up up there by myself. 
And I'm just sitting there looking at the lake, you know, enjoying the view. And I started whistling the end of a Fate's Warning song that has this big, you know, big instrumental part with John Arch kind of humming along with it. And so I'm just kind of humming that along. And in the wind, I hear it hummed back to me. Mm. And I sat there going, is that just my brain doing that? Like, because that was really distinct. And it was exactly what I just hummed. (laughs) And I tried it a few times and it happened a few times. But it's like at the same time, you're, you're like... Maybe I'm just fooling myself, you know? Right, right. Even when it happens, you still are like, you know, did that really just happen? Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, it's easy to question reality. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and even like, I'll give myself a hard time too because I'm like, maybe it's just pattern recognition. Well, that's uh, another thing. Yeah. But... Well, no, I mean, I, I, like, I'll have thoughts like that. Um, you know, one of the things I had to learn, especially if I was playing around with um, divination of some type, was once, you know, I had played with, like, a random number generator or a yes-no generator, mm-hmm. however we want to, you know, whatever tool we're using, was to not ask the question again. <laughs> <laughs> from, okay. From that first answer, because right. my anxiety or, or whatever was like, oh well, is that really the answer I was supposed to get? <laughs> <No> <laughs> the answer I, I wanted. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, you start peeking at it, essentially. You know. Yeah. And, and then, then, then you, de- you destroy it. You destroy it exactly. And so, and then it's it's uh, gone. And so, it's okay to question. Uh, did was this really correct? But also just. You, you can sit with that uh, in uncertainty without picking at it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean... And I find I have good results that way. You also, you know, you talked about pa- pattern recognition. That, mm-hmm. that, that is a thing our brains are, is, have hardwired, mm-hmm. is to do pattern recognition. So just because you see a pattern doesn't mean that pattern has meaning. Right. Now, you can invest it with meaning if you try hard enough, but, Mm -hmm. like, you have to, like, when you're dealing with, like, synchronicities and things like that, you have to have that that sort of balancing act between, is this actually meaningful, Mm -hmm. or am I just recognizing patterns? And I mean, it's what happens with conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They start seeing patterns, and then they start seeing more patterns, but it's like, just because this person could know this person doesn't mean they were in league together, you know? Right. Like, that's not proof. Right. Which is another thing that a lot of people don't really seem to understand the the idea of what what, what proof entails. I mean, we don't have proof of a lot of things. Right. Um, You know, if, if if I smacked you in the face... You know, you you could say you could we could tell people it happened, but could we really prove it? Not really, because if there was nobody else there to see it, right? Have a recording, we really can't. Uh, that's what you know. We were talking about uh, some of the whistleblowers and things earlier. Uh, I'll see people on different online forums say, "Well, this guy, we have firsthand proof of yeah. X, Y, and Z happened at Los Alamos." Because so and so saw it, yeah. And I'm like, no, that's that's just his account. That that's not something that we know happened. That's that's eyewitness testimony. That's not documentation. Right. That's a different thing. And that's not proof. That's just a you know an indicator of maybe we should look closer here at, at most. You know. And you'll hear ghost hunters say things like, well, this EVT, EVT, uh, EVP or, or this video is proof of ghosts. And it's like, no. If it's legitimate and legitimately weird, it's proof of something weird. Yes, exactly. What yeah. that weird thing, you, you, you're, you're going at this from the wrong direction. And I, and I know these people are trying to be scientific, but, I, but they're starting off with a predetermined outcome. Mm-hmm. And that's not scientific. Yeah, and it doesn't mean they didn't record. Right, I think it's right. a ghost, but and it might be a ghost. And it might be a ghost, but it's not. It's not proof. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would even prove something like that. That's the problem. Well, and I don't know if you can. Um, if the thing says I'm a ghost, it's like, yeah, but are you lying? Right, right. That's my my next thought too. Like <laughs> now you're just messing with me. Uh, yeah, you know uh, I. Oh gosh, I, I need to go find this. Uh, quote that uh, Jeff Kripal uses 
but uh, I actually heard, uh, I think, is it Steve Cronenberg? Uh, I don't know. He has a little, uh, a fun podcast where he interviews different, uh, oh, it's not Cronenberg. Oh, my gosh. I've been, uh, anyway, he and uh, Todd Purse were talking about uh, a couple of different things, and this quote from Cripel came up about, basically, like, we get kind of obsessed with what a book is made of when and we forget what a book is about mm. um, so you know if I gave you a copy of Lord of the Rings and you know uh, somebody asked what book I just gave you you would say Lord of the Rings because that's what the content of the book is right but in the paranormal we get very obsessed with what is the material of the book you know is Aragorn made of ink and I see pulp what you're and glue that holds it together nah that's not what Aragorn's made of. Uh, Aragorn's made of story, <laughs> you know? And I think sometimes uh, we want to have the documentation of what something is made of, the materials, uh, and we're never going to get that. Yeah. And that, that's one of those things, like, you know, you talk about ghosts. Like, I, I don't think we can prove that a ghost exists. We, uh, we can prove that weird things happen. We can prove that weird things happen. And we can have weird experiences. And I think part of that, too, is just to be okay with, like, hey, we're not going to know. Yeah. And it's okay not to know, but what uh, happened around it? I mean, my, my, my whole thing is is trying to understand my experiences better. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. To understand what I assume they're trying to show me. Right, right. But, I mean, even in life, in general, you know, I'll look back on things and be like, what did I learn from that? Right, right. Yeah. Don't 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 take the the hot baking tin out of the oven without gloves on. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, in, I, I was thinking about this when we were talking with uh, the folks at the Seth House too. Was just, you know, uh, uh, Ashera was talking about more people thinking like this or being open-minded to these things and at least considering it and comfortable talking about it. And I go back a lot to re-enchanting the world. Yeah. Uh, Because I think that's important because if the world becomes enchanted for you again, your curiosity comes back and it leaves you open for these different things. And I think being open to different experiences also is the reason that, you know, uh, I think, was it Amy that was... uh, the other lady there at the Seth house? Yeah. Yeah, you know, she was talking about her uncle that worked at NASA. Oh, that yeah, had yeah. all the Seth speak yeah. books. And I'm like, you know, but the fact that he ate, that uncle of hers lived in an enchanted world is probably part of the reason that he got so invested in different sciences and was curious about them. And, you know, I, I don't know. I think that keeps us looking and not assuming that we know everything. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that to take away from paranormal experiences because I think sometimes when I try to articulate this, people think that I'm saying it doesn't matter as long as the world is curious to you. That's not what I mean. <laughs> but right. I think the greatest byproduct besides learning about ourselves and having this relationship with real reality versus perceived reality is this curiosity uh, helps us grow in a lot of different ways and takes us down new ways of learning and exploration. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. You know, sometimes I still sit with experiences from years ago going, what was this? Yeah. Like, was this just a random, hey, we're still messing with you and we're still here? Like, I don't even... I don't even mean messing like trickstery because I don't think I've had any experiences where I feel like... Oh, that was just trickster phenomena. And maybe because of the way I address it without settling on a particular idea um, it, that it doesn't kick into the trickster phenomena and maybe why I don't get like the same phenomena repeated mm-hmm. since it always seems to be different types of things happening. Um, yes, I've seen more than one UFO, but they both, both, I wonder mean, how many I've seen. I've definitely have two that I know were anomalous, mm-hmm. and a few that are maybes, um, but they were both completely different from one another. They weren't even remotely the same, um, and I, they're just called UFOs because they were in the air, and I don't know what they were. Right, right. Um, 
but I think once the trickster element pops up when you decide to try and label something and keep it within those boundaries mm -hmm. is where the trickster starts going, oh yeah? Well, hang on, watch this. Yeah, like it, it intentionally wants to defy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And everything, I, I, I have never been lied to. Like when I've been told stuff, it has always been accurate. And it has always been for the better, for the betterment of things. Right. Even if I didn't like what they were telling me. Right. So I'd be like, I don't like that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. And then I was like, I should have done that. I should have listened. All right. I'm stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. That just made me laugh because I. I yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes. These things tell you things you don't want to hear. Yeah. And, and then, then that's when I like to go, oh, I must have made that up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have to listen to that. And and then you find out like, ah, whoops. <laughs> nope, that's what's going to happen anyway. Yeah. And then and that's, you know, like we were talking, about, obviously, on the set stuff about, you know, multiple dimensions and stuff like that. I'm not 100% sure I believe that. Mm -hmm. Like, I wonder if we have one path, but maybe not. I, I, like, I, I flip back and forth all the time on it. Right. Like, do we even have free will? Because if we don't have free will, then there's no need for multiple dimensions. Right. But maybe we have free will within a certain structure. Yeah. Um, and then you say, well, you know, if there's a different universe for every decision you make, that, that's like an infinite number of universes. But if you look out into space, you know, you take these space images where you see what looks like a bunch of stars, you realize they're galaxies. Yeah. I mean, our brain just can't even comprehend that. Right. It just goes, what? No, that's, that's a number I can't count. If you want to count all the stars there, that's not even a possibility. Right. So, I mean, there's no reason to say that, that just because we can't conceive of something that it can't be. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I go back and forth on this, and I never can find... I, I don't... I'm not opposed to the idea of all of these different lives and yeah. every choice you make. Not not at all. You know, one of them that stuck with me a bit was like... It, it, but this also, what I'm going to say, is dependent on a, a time from a certain perspective, but, you know, it's probability collapsing into what was actually happened, right? And so before a moment happens, you have infinite probability and in all the different ways things can go. Right. And uh, But the moment that you live it, it's collapsed into whatever you live. But it's a very linear approach to things. And I actually don't like things to be linear either. Yes. I, I think that's really limiting. But, uh, but, you know, maybe that's a different perspective of everything does happen. You know, from I decided to... Uh, you know, get a Dr. Pepper instead of a Pepsi today at that one moment to mysteriously a fish through the gas station window and hit me in the <laughs> head. It, I mean, that mean it didn't happen somewhere, right? Uh, oh, did, did that happen a little while ago? Yeah. I, I think so. You yeah. just got hit in the head so you don't remember. Right, right, exactly. Um, so, yeah, those, those are things that, I don't know, I, I, I think about this a lot and uh, I have nowhere that I feel more comfortable than anywhere else with it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just try to follow where I think I'm supposed to go and hope for the best. Yeah. Seems to have worked out so far. Because mm -hmm. really, I feel like I'm at, at where I am against all odds. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the only reason I'm where I'm at is because I was supposed to be. Right. You know, there are so many things as I work on my autobiography where I'm like, man, I could have screwed things up royally, royally right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, obviously it's something we're not quite meant to know yet. Yeah. If Seth's right, we get to see all those probable realities when we die. And, you know, from the perspective like that, I wonder if it also means that, you know, would Seth say that we lived all of those too? But we yes. just have it. That's what I thought. Yeah, so we just have individual perception now, but later it would be when we die, like we have the perception of all of it because we did live all of it. And I can totally, uh, I can totally get down with that idea. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
uh, sometimes it might be nice to see what's going on in somebody else's head or some other version of me's head. Right. So I wouldn't have to do those things. I, 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 I want uh, I want to be able to rewind and, and see what would have happened if I made different decisions. Right, exactly. Without exactly. without losing where I am now. Like, like okay, so what, what would have happened if I had done this? Mm-hmm. What about this? What about this? You know? Yeah, exactly. But not have to, to live with it. You know, just like... And I don't mean anything bad. I mean, like, yeah. if I chose this instead of this, where would I be today? Would I still be in the same place? Would I would have somehow curved back around to this particular point? Mm-hmm. Or would I have gone off the rails somewhere into uh, something that sucked? Right, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, so I have this really, uh, you know, my dad passed away when I was in uh, my 20s, early 20s. And I went home and did a lot of things I probably... And I don't regret the things that I did, but things my dad probably would not have let me do, to be honest, uh, because he would have kept me on a little bit more of a uh, straight and narrow path, uh, not out of any kind of, you know, you got to be this way, son, that kind of thing, but just, you know, a, a little bit more supervision mm-hmm. that uh, after he passed away, I didn't have. So I just, you know, took off and went and did things. Uh, you know, it was years later, my mom was laughing about, I was talking about going to do something and it just didn't even phase her. And she goes, what's that? And you're you, uh, <laughs> you know, like you just go and do stuff that you want to do. You took off to Asia, you took off to different parts of the world and learned this and learned that, which, you know, uh, they probably would have kept me from. And so yeah. I'm very curious what I have ended up where I am now, right. uh, if he had not died when I was in my early 20s. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, like that could have had a very big effect on you. Yeah, because I think I probably would have lived a little bit more of uh, um, what people would consider a traditional life. Yeah. You know, whatever that is. <laughs> it's different for everyone. Well, exactly. But everyone wants to think that theirs is the, the right one. Right, right. Well, not everyone. I mean, I think enough people realize that Life is different for everyone, and it's okay. Mm-hmm. But there are definitely those those movements in our culture of this is what should be normal, and everything else should not be. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So, anyway, I yeah. guess we'll stop there, and we're going to go explore the Connecticut Hill Cemetery. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. I'm really excited for Chris to be there with us. Yes. So, as I said... Um, we didn't really get anything uh, audio-wise at the Connecticut Hill Cemetery. I do have a video from actually last year that I still have to edit of uh, the first time Saxon went up there uh, with uh, Natalie and I. And uh, again, nothing really weird happened other than the fact that everything was just eerily quiet. And every time I've been up there, that's been the case, you know, even in the middle of summer. So it's it's definitely an, a location we're going to check out a little more and hopefully catch something uh, on on audio or video at some point. I mean, it has UFO encounters and ghosts and uh, Bigfoot encounters and all kinds of stuff. And uh, it's definitely a, a high strangeness spot from people who I have talked to who have lived up there or who have just gone up there and had weird things happen. So it's definitely something we're looking at. And, um, yeah, uh, hopefully we'll get something interesting at some point. Chris and I kind of want to do a little more with it, maybe do a mini documentary on the area or something, but uh, we'll see how all that goes. Uh, This next segment, however, uh, Saxon and I did one one more segment when we were on the way to the cemetery. And um, he's always uh, fond of saying when he can't remember something, he's been hit in the head a lot. And uh, I'll, I'll usually counter with, yeah, me too. And so we decided to spend a couple minutes on our top, I think it was top three uh, worst times we've been hit in the head. So uh, yeah, this is just a fun little bit with Saxon and I to end things off. All right, Saxon, Mm -hmm. worst time you've been hit in the head. Worst time I've been hit in the head. Okay. Um, Now, anytime or specifically in martial arts? No, anytime. Anytime. Okay. Anytime. There can be more than one. There can be more than one. Okay. Uh, if you so, can remember them. Well, so one story, uh, it's a little unfortunate to be honest, uh, but it, it's a good story. Uh, you know, it. I used to I used to have a lot of fun in my 20s. And <laughs> I was at a club 
and there were some people by the door that were arguing with the doorman and some other people. And I was trying to leave, and so I decided that I would squeeze through these people. And I think, I don't know what happened, one of them decided that I was with the other group. Mm. I don't know. But because I had been hit many times in my life at this point already doing martial arts, uh, I remember trying to get through the people, and the next thing I know, I am outside talking to somebody. And I got this like kind of feeling on my eye and my face, and I'm like, I recognize this feeling. This is weird. Huh. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it, and I realize this guy has helped me walk out because one of those people at the door has punched me. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, he thought the, the best I could put together was one of those groups was uh, some girls that I didn't know, but, you know, he thought that I might have been with them, I guess. And so the jerk decided that since he thought I was with him, uh, he would punch me. So that sucked. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> that hurt. Um, Let's see. My, mine, one of mine would be uh, going out to my car mm -hmm. in the winter. It was snowing. And I had just, I didn't bother to put shoes back on. I just had slippers on. Oh. Uh -huh. And I didn't throw a jacket on. I just forgot something in the car. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to run again. I'm not going to do all, you know, I'm not going to put shoes on and a coat on just to run to the car. And I got outside and I went, oh, oh, it is cold. It is way colder than I realized. Okay. I'm going to jog to the car. So I started Ooh. jogging. And then I realized, oh, I better be careful. There's a lot of ice up here where the car is. So I stop. Except I stopped right on the ice. Mm -hmm. And my feet flew out from underneath me and I landed on the back of my head and neck. Ugh. And so, you know, that bright flash of light you get. Uh-huh. And laid there for a minute, went, well, at least I'm still conscious because the snow was coming down so hard that my body would have disappeared within minutes. <laughs> and no one would have known I was out there if I was buried unconscious. under the snow. <laughs> and like I got up, and when I got up, I like wobbled because I ripped the some of the muscles in my neck. Oh man, yeah. And luckily, I had a decent amount of muscle in my neck from headbanging, quite frankly. Um, so, like I'm like I'm off balance. Holy crap! And for like a few days, like it it hurt to hold my head up. Like, if yeah. I was sitting on the couch, I'd have to kind of put my hand behind it or a pillow behind it uh -huh. because the muscles would just ache. So, that that was a bad one. That, that sounds like that sucked a lot. <laughs> you know, what's interesting, like, on the martial arts side of things, you know, I've always been hit with boxing gloves. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, and these are 16-ounce gloves usually, maybe 14-ounce. When you fight, you're using 12 and 10-ounce gloves a lot of times. And, and those hurt more. Uh, it's, a, it's a sharper pain. But because when you practice, you're using those 16-ounce um, gloves, it, it's a like a very thud kind of pain as opposed to like a crack. Mm -hmm. And so it, it sucks, but it's not awful uh, compared to like, you know, if somebody was bare knuckle or if you got hit with an MMA glove even. Uh, those ones, you know, you feel those pretty quick. Uh, but I've only been hit clean maybe once or twice with an MMA glove. and uh, It feels like you're going unconscious pretty fast. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you, you have the... If it, nobody's ever been punched in a fight and started to go unconscious, like, the, the image in front of your eyes really does kind of pull out in front of you, for lack of a better term. Hmm. Let's see. Chris. Uh, we might have lost Chris. Where's Chris? Well, Chris should be on the GPS. It was a car pulling out, so he might have had a... Oh, maybe have got stuck behind him. But yeah, you, you had the image pulling out in front of your eyes. I don't think I've had that experience. It, it's interesting. It's not, uh, you start to recognize it after a while, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, huh. let, me, let me catch myself here. And uh, yeah, so that really happens. And it's not fun. <laughs> but you're also so adrenalized and things like that that it doesn't hurt the same way as, like, when you slipped on the ice, uh, you know, your body's not really gearing up for hurting your neck and your head in that right, situation. Right, right, yeah. You don't have the time. But, you know, if you're sparring, you're doing these things, there's a lot of endorphin dumps going on. So it hurts, but it, it doesn't hurt the same. 
Yeah, yeah. Is it, I, I can't say it actually hurt because I have a very high pay to alerts. <laughs> um, and now we're on a dirt road, which I'm sure is making this sound great. Um, Where'd the road go? <laughs> no, it's still there. It's, it's just still, dirt. It's just dirt. Um, is Chris still behind us? I don't see him behind us. Let's we'll slow down for just a moment see if we'll catch up. Uh, so I, I had years ago decided I wanted to learn how to do a moonsault. Which okay. is a backflip off uh, off of something in wrestling, like usually the top rope. And I said, how hard can this be? So I threw a bunch of cushions on the floor. I actually did it at the radio station. A bunch of cushions on the floor because it was a nice high, like, 12-foot ceiling. And a nice solid built-into-the-wall cabinet on the side. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would try and just backflip off of it onto these cushions. And each time I did it, I wasn't getting all the way over, so I kept coming straight down to my head. Oh, geez. And a couple of times I got stingers and just kind of ignored, you know, shook it off and went and did it again, which now I would be, I would not have done that because who knows how much damage I did to my spine at the time. Right. Um, but when you're like 21, you don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and so wrestling around with someone, I, I, I picked them up, body slammed them on a cushion, told them to move. And we, it's on video. Uh, and I and I bounced over the couch and I started to backflip and paused to make sure he moved out of the way. And when I paused, I didn't have enough momentum going over. Uh, and I caught my temple on the cement floor when I came down. Oh my gosh. And it was just bright flash of light. And I'm like, oh, and now I'm seeing double. I probably just gave myself a concussion. All right, cool. And then I went back and continued running the radio show. <laughs> and one of the guys there is going, that was awesome. What move was that called? I'm like, that's called me screwing up and hitting my head on the cement. <laughs> okay, your turn. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, now I'm wishing there were wrestling moves I tried. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, the, the, the bad thing when you hang out with all these martial artists is like everybody's rowdy. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, especially when I would go with my instructor and he would teach in the UK. He, he had students over there from when he had been stationed there in the military. And um, anyway, inevitably when we would get together over there, travel and, you know, stay for a weekend teaching one place or the other, like, you know, everybody would go out together. And, uh, you know, just have fun and be very rowdy people, I yeah. guess. And one night... Um, we're in this like little club, and uh, we'll, we'll call this guy John since it's nothing like his name. Goes and uh, sees this other guy Ray on the dance floor, and he goes up behind Ray and he chokes him unconscious on oh. the dance floor, which is just kind of a thing that would happen sometimes when we're getting rowdy. And then John comes over to us at the bar, and Ray's standing there. And he goes, Ray, what are you doing here? I've just choked you out over there. <laughs> it wasn't Ray. It wasn't Ray. He choked out some random strangers. <laughs> so we left. Because <laughs> he had just choked out somebody. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things where you're like, oh my gosh, this is just stupid. I can't believe that just happened. Um, but it was also kind of hilarious. <laughs> So you didn't get hit in the head. No, I didn't get hit in the head, but but it's a funny story I was yes, there for. Yeah, it was. You know, it, but those are the kind of shenanigans we get into sometimes. It's kind of funny. We, we were shooting one of the old movies we made, and uh, I'm fighting my friend Dan in the movie. And Dan's the small little guy, and I'm, I'm just kind of like ragdolling him around the room. And uh, we put a, a, a piece of, uh, it was a uh, door to like a shelf, uh -huh. like a sliding door to a shelf. And it was this big black door. And so I throw him into the area where this is. And um, he goes, he picks it up and he's like, oh, black metal. I love black metal. And then he turns around and starts beating me with it. <laughs> And so he, he hit me across the, I told him just to hit me full force. So he hits me across the back a bunch of times, which I don't feel. But then, after not feeling it, like, I was like, oh, my whole back is numb. That's interesting. And then suddenly I got all the pins and needles. Ooh, and I'm wow. like, oh, there's the sensations. Okay. Um, so then I'm like, all right, well, that's fine. And 
the end bit was us running up this staircase. I was going to run up the outside of it. He was going to run up the inside of it. And then I would grab him and he'd whip the, the metal at my face. Mm. And uh, I was going to duck and, and I'll hit it with my forehead. I didn't duck. So it hit <laughs> me clean across the nose. Oh my gosh. And uh, I was like, and I fell backwards through a table we had set up. And so, like, the next day I'm with my girlfriend, and I'm like, why does my nose hurt? And she's like, I don't know. Did you get hit in the face with a piece of metal? And I'm like, right. Yeah, that would, <laughs> that would be it, wouldn't I'm it? Like, That's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> All right. Well, we are almost to Connecticut Hill. Yeah. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my patrons, especially those of you pledging $10 or more, because you're the ones that keep making this show possible. So my thanks to Greg Ross, Illuminati, Cara Henryson, John Blackburn, Madeline J, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Midnight Review presents Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain. Patricia Guy Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, the land of the crazy and communicable, CJ, Craig Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J, J Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, John Hewling, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K., MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Roland Belstadt, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Sarah Horgan, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls. Stacy, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, The Esoteric Book Club Podcast, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Victoria, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, Colin Karras, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. A little bit different type of show this week. Like I said, next week should be listener stories and lots of other fun stuff coming up. Uh, I want to welcome a few new patrons, uh, Catherine Peach, Kieran Stacy, Oren Jones, Miles Finlayson, Amanda, Etherton Horton, Carrie McCabe, and Roland Beldstedt. Welcome to the Patreon of Where Did the Road Go? And I hope you enjoy all the extra content. There's years worth of stuff to go through, and I'm adding to it all the time. You get extra stuff every week. If you want to become a patron, it's only three bucks. And if you like the show, it helps out tremendously. So thank you all for that and thank you all for listening and if you want to give the show a good rating on whatever you listen to or share it with your friends that's that's also a way that can seriously help us out all right that's it for this week see you next time you have been listening to where did the road go this show is made possible in part from our patreons and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange you can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>